This weekend's Reorient Forum and Festival has been in the works for months. Uh, we began early conversations with our program partners uh, end of last year, early this year. And I want to just take a moment to acknowledge those program partners. Uh, many of them are here in the room. Theatre Without Borders, Theatre Bay Area, Theatre Communications Group, Three Dimensional, Hybrid Theatre Works, University of San Francisco, Z Space, our host, and our Middle East America partners, Lark Play Development and Silk Road Rising. So thank you so much for being a part of creating this weekend's program. Uh, the Reorient Festival, as many of you know, was created to showcase the diversity of the Middle East and its worldwide diaspora. Similarly, the forum provides a space for conversations that build on that diaspora to redefine identities and reshape culture. Looking at what is going on between Israel and Palestine today, I'm reminded of, of the painful limits of politics and the bankrupt imagination of politicians. I'm inspired by the movements for self-determination and civil rights in Iran, Egypt, and Tunisia, but I worry about their chances of success. What room is there for peaceful transformation where guns are held against us? What role do artists play in shaping and reflecting society? I look forward to learning from you the answers to these questions, this impressive group of speakers that we've gathered here this weekend. Uh, this conversation will help steer our imagination as we continue to navigate these precarious times. Imagination was our guide as the Unparalleled New Orient team meticulously devised and implemented the plans for the Reorient Festival and Forum. I want to take a moment and introduce them. Uh, Laura Benson, who um, put up the fabulous breakfast spread out there. Uh, Jesse Brownstein, in charge of our live streaming and production manager. Uh, Lane Foreman, uh, who will be with us shortly. Navid uh, and Lane will be with us shortly because they will share your ride. Um, Michelle Mulholland, who's at the front desk, our operations manager. Evren Ochkin, Literary Artistic Associate of Golden Thread and Marketing Guru. Um, Danielle, our Marketing Associate, somewhere back there. Uh, Heather, who will join me uh, on stage, please, just so that you can see her. Heather is the Forum Coordinator and she will MC the program this weekend. Any questions you have, personal, live, Mercury, retrograde, whatever, direct them to Heather, she'll be able to answer you. Thanks, Heather. Um, let's see, did I miss anybody? Uh, uh, no. so, so now it's my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, he is one of the most unique thinkers of our time. He's an in as inspiring as controversial. A teacher, writer, unmatched scholar, Hamid Dabashi has challenged us with his ideas and analysis for many years. My first introduction to Hamid's work was with his book, Theater of Diaspora, a collection of plays by Paris Sayo. Next, I read his article on Tazie, where he analyzed the use of Tazie symbology in the national referendum that resulted in the establishment of the Islamic Republic in Iran. Anyone who tells you theater has no impact on politics needs to read that article. So, thank you so much for being here, Hamid Dabashi. for you to come and brave this fantastic weather we have uh, in, uh, in your beautiful town. Uh, first and foremost, my absolute gratitude to dear friend and colleague Torange for including me in this conversation, to Heather for uh, braving your traffic and picking me up from the airport and all the other accoutrement of uh, coming here. Uh, I'm absolutely honored to be part of this uh, distinguished uh, number of panelists for you to talk today. I look forward to hearing them. I was uh, privileged to uh, watch a number of fantastic plays last night in, uh, in the next uh, space right next to me uh, here. Uh, and um, my eldest daughter, Pat, is, 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 a, is a theater actor. I just text her. She's in Boston uh, uh, for these 
exquisite, uh, uh, directed, acted, uh, written uh, number of plays, both in terms of formal aspects of performance and, and uh, dramaturgy and the relevance, the political relevance to our contemporary uh, uh, time. Now, uh, as for my talk, Heather said that he, uh, she would tell me when to stop, but the thing is, after you he becomes wife like this, nobody can stop me. <laughs> uh, we have a we have an expression in Persian that uh, you know some people are, are reticent to dance, so we keep asking them to dance or to sing, and then when they stop singing and dancing, we can't stop them. So we say you have to give them a dollar to start singing, then you have to give them three dollars to stop uh, uh, singing and dancing. So uh, I have something to share, uh, something to uh, read for you. It's a, it's a you know, formal, in, in honor and respect of my host. It's a, it's a formal uh, reflection. And reflection is uh, the two concepts in what uh, Torange gave me, uh, identity and alterity, are uh, central to what I'm going to read. And I'm going to think it through the question of accent. And in order, to, what does it mean to have an accent? What is the notion of accent? Uh, and in order to put it right on the spot, let me give you, uh, I've been thinking about the writing about accent for quite some time. But when Toranja asked me to, to talk about the issue of in our own words, and the question of identity and alterity, uh, I was reminded recently, a couple of months ago, I was in Tucson, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, to give a talk. And I was put in this fantastic uh, uh, inn uh, in which you have communal breakfast. I'm sure you have, you have communal breakfast with other members of the, uh, who are in this, uh, in this inn. And uh, at the breakfast, we were just politely having sort of pep talks and conversations. And uh, there were a number of other guests in this inn. And at some point, a very nice lady asked me, and where do you come from? <laughs> I said, uh, ma'am, I come from New York. And she said, I do detect a little bit of accent. <laughs> and I said, yes, ma'am, so do I. <laughs> So the key question is about this act, the business of accent is uh, how, come, how is it that people don't hear their own accent uh, and then immediately they recognize that you have a little bit of accent. Uh, so the, if you think, if you uh, bear with me, it's not too long, I don't think Heather has to call the police. Uh, it's not too long, but it's, uh, it's, I, I, I invite you to, uh, to think with me along with this question of identity and alternative, and uh, business of politics, and uh, so forth. So here it is. In our own words. What words, I wonder? You mean in Persian, English, Arabic, German, or what? In the electronic flyer announcing my talk here at Reorient 2012 Festival and Forum, we have a citation that reads, quote, at a time when the Middle East dominates the headlines, the Orient aspires to forge clarity of chaos. This time the festival incites us to look past the 24-7 media blitz to see the cycles of tragedy. San Jose Mercury News. Tragedy? Why tragedy? Who said all we have in this ghastly, colonial, chimeric, we have concocted and we keep regurgitating as the Middle East, all we have are no, more, no less than cycles of tragedy. How about comedy, drama, epic, lyricism, gibberish, frivolity, nonsense, all of them together, none of them in particular. Why and by what authority Cycles of tragedy. So, no. Cycles of tragedy are not our own words. San Jose Mercury News protests too much. Yes, we have had our share of tragedy, but also much more. And in the general title I have been given to talk about here at the Orient 2012 Festival and Forum, 
to me the current state of the arts, identity, alterity, and representation in the current climate of change and upheaval. Now, these are my words. Our words. Words I did not write, but can easily claim and call my own, even the nervous repetition of the word current twice in a short sentence. <laughs> so, which words are our own and which are not? The good words. Words that sustain our fragile humanity. As Nima says in Murwa Amin, the aim and saying bird, و زبان آن که با درد کسان پیوند دارد باد میان باد آمی و هران اندیشه در ما مردگی آموز دیران آم آم و خراب آید در آوار قرید لعنت بیدار محرومان هر خیال کچ که خلق خسته را به آن نخواه and may the tongue of he who is rooted in people's pain be eloquent. Let it be. Amen. And whatever thought teaches us passivity, may it go to ruins. Amen. Amen. And may it go to ruins under the defiant cries of the wretched of the earth. Every crooked thought that the tired masses have defied. So no. Cycles of tragedy are not our words. It is a crooked thought that the tired but defiant masses defy. The words, as you see, that are not our own can be in Persian, Arabic, Turkish, English, Dutch, French, Italian, Swedish, Hausa, German, Spanish, Malayalam, ad infinite. And the question they ask in this time of massive labor, including intellectual labor, migration, is what exactly is our own words, our own language? What language is it that we can call our own? Bilingualism, living happily in two or more houses, two or more homes, two or more worlds, is the condition of living self-transformative transfusing oneself interchangeably from one into the other, thus confusing their boundaries, living comfortably upon that wide and widening margin that separates one artificially manufactured identity from another. We, the socially marginalized, dare in fact to fancy ourselves culturally amphibian and thus politically liberated from all atrocities perpetrated on both sides of every border. Worlds thus placed against each other self-substitute and dodge grafted, dodge being grafted into one claustrophobic nationalism or another. We become transnationalists, dodging the banality while partaking in the emancipatory disposition of both. The public space we thus form, and the public art we thus stage, and the public intellectual we hereby anticipate, belongs to no notion state in particular, and yet no notion state in particular can evade the caring intellect that forms and informs our very nosy, nosy meandering into forcibly nationalized boundaries, we ipso facto define. We, the many. In between any two worlds that claim us, and embracing and overcoming them both, our autobiography becomes ipso facto heterographical. We are the heterographers of our own autobiography. By writing our own stories, we are writing the unwritten, the unread, and disallowed lives of all our others, who have historically sustained their own identity by writing us out of their own histories. We are ghostwriters, having come back to haunt them. The difference between English and Persian, or German and Arabic, etc., between what I now say in English and I might, just might, 
also, also be able to say in Persian becomes tantamount to a Viridian difference. Different by virtue of a constant difference. That by always already deferring one language to another, the gesture implicates an ever-changing other. Dismantles the metaphysics of presence, embedded with any particular language and within it, any notion of origin or finality. There does take on Freud's trace, Shkua, as an inscription of difference, in this case becomes the accent we speak or write in a language not our own and yet made paradoxically our own precisely by the virtue of that accent. This paradoxical claim of accent becomes the political unconscious of the accented language. In Dissimilation 1972, Derrida demonstrated how the unconscious in fact lacks any inherent, hidden, or virtual self-presence. That it is in fact the site of an alterity, a past that was never present, nor will it ever be. This for us means the increasing evidence of an accent that we have in fact invented for the language that used to be our host and is now our guest. Keep in mind that Derrida's insight about the past that was never present is exactly the opposite of William Faulkner's famous and flawed statement in Requiem for a Nun, 1950, that the past is never dead, it's not even past. Recently misquoted by Woody Allen in his Midnight in Paris, 2012, and resulted in a lawsuit filed by the Faulkner Library. <laughs> In the scene, when the time-traveling protagonist, Alan Wilson, says, the past is not dead, actually it is not even past. You know who said that? Faulkner. And he was right. I met him too. I ran into him at a dinner party. It's actually a clear indication that the past is constantly reinvented. In this case, Woody Allen reinventing something that Faulkner had not in fact said. And yet, that fallacious attribution made proper sense when and where Allen used it in his film, where William Faulkner is no longer the famous author of Absalom, Absalom and other books, but a mere trope, a citation. What do such acts of creation and performance in all these accented languages do to the moment of my nieces? or even more important to the necessary instinct of Theophandus effect, of making the strange, of the Brechtian alienation, of making strange. There is a proposition that language is ipso facto haunted by its own innate propensity towards dispersal and loss becomes far more evident in between any two languages than inside any particular language. For that is precisely where a philosophy becomes literature in another language and vice versa. That dismantled my nieces, where seriousness becomes frivolity and frivolity gets serious, where jokes cannot be translated and metaphysics of morals become orientalist jokes, is precisely the location where the hidden or repressed and doing of sense on the borderline of nonsense begins to make perfect sense. Here in the heart of the other language, which we have made our own, we do not just make the foreign familiar. We also make the familiar foreign, as in the case of making that very nice woman aware that she speaks with an accent. And you can only imagine how unnerving that can be, both to our mother and to our children's tongue. We are the bridge of the strangers, threatening the fabricated authenticity of cultures, exposing the fabricated authenticity and insularity. As we infiltrate into cultures, and by making them strangers to themselves, we make ourselves familiar to them, and thus we make them while confirming them in delusion that they are a melting pot. 
We are the return of the cultural repressed, that it was fabricated by concealing its own negations, dispersions, disseminations. In theorizing cultural hybridity, Baba, in effect, did exactly the opposite of what he thought he was doing. He cross-authenticated the two sides of that presumed hybridity and posited a liminal space where there is none. For Baba, boundary is the location of the emerging culture, whereas the consistent chasing of labor and capital after each other has made a mockery of the borders and boundaries. Baba's conception of liminality is thus a self-alienating proposition that is predicated on the phobia of flying, or swimming, or both, precisely in the moment when the cross he cross-essentializes and cross-authenticates both sides of the presumed liminality, attributing to them to a metaphysics of authenticity and certainty that they, in fact, lack, but always successfully fake. Bobo authenticated that fake claim to authenticity by providing a space in between for it. We bilinguals are not liminal, we are amphibians. We possess languages, not despite our accent, but because of them. As we master a new alien dominant language, we don't just possess them, we hunt and we make them possessed by us. We are not made a stranger to our own womb for living, for having lived in other worlds. We live in two or more worlds, and by just living them, we have made them familiar to ourselves and as strangers to themselves. And in that strangeness, these worlds rediscover themselves. Thanks to strangers that they seek to make of us, we dismantle the metaphysics of authenticity, the self-totalizing, proclivities, their metaphysics of presence, where we are their always already repressed absences. We intruders are chameleons, and by the time our children with their Persian or Arabic or Indian or Turkish names start speaking German, English, French or Italian, the paradox of that Fiefendum has dismantled the binary metaphysics that makes all false claims to authenticity possible. We, by coastal creatures of two or more seas, dismantle the self-totalizing proclivities of all cultures. We are not cultural hybrids. Hybridity was a false idea theorized from an anxiety of dual identity. We are not dual. We expose duality, and in a tertiary move, we move forward and discover new continents. We healthy and wholesome, bi or multilingual creatures are prophets of ruins and fragmentations of dismantling fascistic monolinguals who think they are the center of the universe. We center the universe, we decenter the knowing subject, we iterate on parallel and diagonal lives that intersect and diverse. We, the artists and critics of the foreign in the familiar, are a threat to homonormativity. We confuse the color line by our heteronormativity. We are always the other, mimicking the other. And through that mimicry, they cannot tell us themselves from the other. We are the invention of our others as we mimic, as we mimic ourselves. On those ruins of the self-totalizing myth, we are the allegories of our own austerities, of the world, of the worlds in plural yet to come. We are the nightmares of Rostam al and thriving on it. In the famous letter of Rostam al in Shah Mohammed's Pegdusi, when Rostam al bemoans the mixing of races that is about to happen in Iran in the aftermath of the Arab invasion. The Iran as Turk or as Hazian, نجادی پدید آگرم در میان نه دفقان نه ترک و نه تازی بود سخنها به کردار بازی بود این در تمیز 
from Iranians and Turks and Arabs, a new race will emerge that is neither Iranian or Turk or Arab. What he bemoans, we must celebrate. But the miracle of discovery is this last part of the stanza. Sohanha bikirdar bazirullah. The way that Rustam Farasar means it is, words will lack meaning. But the actual original uh, words, words become playful. Bazi, most fantastic word in Persian. Sohanha, words, bikirdare, they act as if. Bazi, is this a stage? What people do is bazi, they act. Words become playful. We, beautiful mongrels, are the inheritors of the earth and we sing beautiful songs. Ahle Pashona, this is the rocks of the day. Nasadam Shayat Derasad, Bikyahi Darhen, Besofal Niriyas Khakisyak. Nasadam Shayat Bezen Fakishidar Shakr Bukhara. I am from Kashan. My ancestry reaches all the way back to the planting Indian or a relic from the Siak Mount. My ancestry perhaps reaches to a prostitute in Bukhara. Thank you. sure that the email I sent somehow reached you. Uh, um, in the United States, uh, we had this... Uh, uh, louder. <laughs> you want me to speak louder? Yes. yes. I can hear myself. I don't um, in the United States, we have this thing called political or uh, identity politics. And I would propose that uh, that is a reduction of what you're talking about. And if you elevate the, um, the different identities from different cultures, the problem, of course, in the United States is two things. One is this is the empire. Uh, the other one is there is an infinite level of reduction of any of these ideas. So that all I have to do is twist it just a bit and it becomes kind of foolish. So how does somebody who is advocating some kind of uh, elevation of the mind to deal with this Problem. Uh, the question, if you didn't hear it back there, is that uh, if I understood you correctly, and do, do please correct me if I did not, uh, is uh, what I said might be interpreted as uh, reduced to uh, politics of identity. Uh, my position uh, is precisely the opposite of politics of identity. Exactly. Uh, politics of identity is going to uh, Hawaii, I'm going to New York. Exactly the opposite. Uh, and by virtue of, uh, in fact, believing and relying on the factual evidence of sociality. And by that, I don't have any fictitious notion of sociality. Right here, beginning at 9 o'clock until this moment, we have created a sociality. By virtue of my saying something, you're responding, and we're beginning to commute. This creates a shared memory. And that shared memory begins to form identity beyond I have no idea where, where is your, your background or what, how uh, is that background relevant to what you just said. Nor does it matter that it, that becomes reductionist. What is important is the factual evidence of the collective space of the public reason, as Immanuel Kant said. We generate that public reason right now as we, as we speak. This reality has, for me, far more, is far more palpable than somebody saying, oh, what Hamid just said has to do with being from Saudi Arabia, or she, let's say.
huge. I remember my eldest daughter, Padis, uh, once somebody was asking her, how do you say we in Persian? She said, in, in Persian, you don't say we, you say a. <laughs> so it's not, a, it's not a verbal ex expression, it's an emotive expression. And uh, then she's more verbal, she's a theater, she's more verbal, so as a result her Persian is far more fluent than, than her elder uh, brother. You can't legislate. The, the whole point of the, uh, the argument is you have to be true to who you are, speak whatever language that comes uh, naturally to you, and let the chips fall. And the chips usually fall in the most surprising, fantastic, and beautiful uh, places. And I don't believe, uh, I live in New York. I mean, uh, the first language is, uh, is the Spanish. Uh, and yeah, occasionally people also speak translate into English uh, as well. It's not, uh, and uh, to me, this is glorious. This is, this is how it is. This is history, history, the written history of migrations, labor migrations that have happened in these uh, societies. So my, uh, from my own experiences is that, first of all, kids are different. They're, they have different modes of register and what they do. Uh, uh, and how central language is to their, uh, their life. Uh, so, yeah. Next question. Uh, first, I, I <clears throat> maybe not a question, but maybe a, a request, which is that you know I, I got cramps from likely misquoting your paper as you were speaking, and uh, um, which is in, in line with your your uh, your uh, moment uh, with William and Faulkner. But um, I would hope that uh, there's a way that we could uh, access your your words uh, online or something. I would really appreciate uh, having a chance to read and, uh, and unpack your. Your presentation, a bit sure. More. Happily, I'll, I'll give it to you. That'd be wonderful. Uh, I I wanted to ask your thoughts about um, the, the the notion of global citizenship, and um, you know, as a, it was something that uh, I myself, an immigrant, and living here for over 25 years already, but um, the practice of work that takes me to other parts of the world, and I always thought about that as a opportunity to to take in um, um, different different ways of doing things and being and uh, incorporating into my own and, and as a way to opening up um, my, my own sense of self. Um, I was listening to Bandana Shiva speaking about uh, how to how do how do we move forward from the situation we, we live in and, and she was uh, an adamant advocate for the rebirth of a of a global citizenship consciousness, and, and I wonder what your thoughts are about that, based on what you were talking about today, and, and if that is possible um, beyond, uh, so moving beyond um, the idea of actually traveling from one place to another. I don't know if I'm making sense with my question. Yes, yes. Uh, beginning with the notion of global citizenship, I think that there is an element of false. Uh, False identification, false identification. The morning after September 11, I'm walking uh, towards my office, and dear, dear uh, friend, colleague, I've known her for decades, uh, on Columbia campus, very progressive politically, etc., comes to me and says, "But I mean, why did they do this?" And I said, "You know, I didn't come to ask you what Timothy McVeigh did." morning after the Oklahoma bombing. Why do you think just because his name was Muhammad and my name is Hani, I have an inroad into the mind of a mass murderer? It's a false identity by virtue of one name or another. Or, or a sense of, uh, for example, guilt that if uh, Osama bin Laden is doing something you think, then I have to feel ashamed because of, uh, I'm a Muslim. Or any other false uh, identity. But the the opposite of that is not a vacuous global citizenship. The opposite of that, I believe, is what Zimmer called web of group affiliation that we generate around ourselves. The notion of self that you said, self is not abstract. Self, Zimmer said, or the self that becomes manifested in society, is the, is the result of the number of web of group affiliations with which you identify whatever those webs of uh, group affiliations uh, are. Now, through social networking, 
an additional circle is made possible by virtue of uh, in this web of group affiliation. And uh, I have things far more in common with people in remote parts of the world, but nothing in common with my own neighborhood. And yet, and vice versa. So my being Iranian and living, uh, having lived in the U.S. for uh, 40 years, means nothing, and this is what I in answer to Muhammad's uh, conversation with me, the question of hyphen, I don't know what the, but as, soon as, as, as soon as you say I'm an Arab American, you have cross-essentialized Arab and American, as if there are only one kind of Arab and one kind of American. The hyphen cross-authenticates them both. Whereas far more realistic is this diversity and multiplicities of the group affiliations with which we, uh, we identify. That is, you professionally may identify with somebody who lives actually in the, uh, in the enemy land, as it were. But emotive, I mean, we just saw this fantastic play last night about a Lebanese uh, poet and an Israeli uh, uh, translator who's in love with, uh, with her poetry. So, well, by web of group affiliation, I mean suddenly poetry becomes a web that creates two people that are supposed to be each other's enemies. I mean, the whole drama is because of this cross, crossing of these two boundaries that generates a tertiary mode of uh, solidarity. That, uh, I mean, the whole drama is that they have to surpass that, uh, and the homoerotic aspect helps it uh, unfold better. Uh, th this is far more real than anything. Uh, Abi Mograbi, Fantastic Palestinian, uh, is, uh, I mean, look at the, the thing, Israeli documentary filmmaker has a uh, documentary called Avenge But One of My Two Eyes. I don't know if you have seen it. It's absolutely one of the best documentaries on Palestinian situation by an Israeli documentary filmmaker. Avenge But One of My Two Eyes. What Avi does is, he goes and asks uh, Israelis to talk about their experience of, of, of Holocaust, as Holocaust survivors. And then visually he shows the predicament of Palestinians and Israelis and the known to themselves are providing a narrative of Palestinian predicament. And the result is a fantastic documentary. Hope it makes some sense. Okay. I'm sorry, we have just a short time for questions. Um, we're going to take just one more. And I, I invite you all to um, approach Dr. Dabashi and more during the, the lunch time or the breaks. Um, but yeah, so we have one more time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Dabashi. Uh, that's a wonderful lecture. Um, I, I have a question. Um, I'm going to preface my question with a little bit of a description of myself. So I'm a, a supposed or a so called Arab. Uh, and I have uh, Shia, Sunni, Kurdish, Turkish, Azerbaijani roots <laughs> somehow mixed in there. Um, uh, you know, according to some writers, I'm totally at war with myself. You know, so <laughs> it's kind of disturbing. But um, I, I, what I've noticed as an author um, is that there's this notion that a lot of us have of return. And um, returning to something. And it's a very vague notion. And I, wish, I hope you could uh, maybe talk to me or talk to us a little bit about this idea of return. Uh, the pitfalls and the dangers and maybe you know, the greater, you know, what is it that we're really thinking about or aspiring towards when we, when we talk about return? I think uh, just you know, like every other great question, the answer is in it, maybe the hybridity, the, the multifaceted aspect, which is real, of your identity, which is very similar to my identity. I also come from the southern part of the world. And I mean, to make it uh, even more attractive, uh, I, I, I'm the result of a devout she mother, very white in complexion, brunette and, and uh, light brown eyes, and a socialist father, uh, very dark black in, the, in his uh, complexion. Uh, they, they call him Dadisi. His name was Khodadad. They call him Dadisi, Dadi the Black. And so we had a little bit of a Hotel of Desdemona situation. Uh, <laughs> mine, is, mine is a Trump. And they, they married and they loved each other and they had three sons, so obviously they had a splendid time. Uh, uh, 
So many people say, oh, you know, how, I mean, how could you be a Muslim and then a socialist? Said, well, and then to make it even more exciting, we had a Mullah Javad, a blind Mullah Javad, who would come uh, once a month, uh, and he was a devout Khomeini activist. He was back in the 60s. My father, well, then the other thing is he, was, he worked for the railroad. So three weeks of the month that he, has, he had money for his vodka, and cooking for us and listening to Amr Kulsum and uh, Abdul Wahab, he was a he was complete Mossadegh nationalist. Fourth week of the month, he ran out of money, he had finished his vodka, so he couldn't drink when he was cooking and listening to the thing, so he became a Nasserai socialist in the, in the fourth week of the, of, of the month. You see, this but autobiographical by, by way of saying, they, and then depending when Mullah Jawad came, they got into a discussion, but it, it, it differed month to month, whether he hit my father in his nationalist for three weeks or <laughs> socialist for three weeks. The point is that in that real, fantastic, cosmogonic reality, return to what? You follow? I'm, I'm supposed to return to where? First of all, there is no return. 1997, I was just in uh, Dr. Samia, in 1997, I, I went back to Iran after 90 years. I mean, it was a completely different land. Radically different land. I moved from New Jersey to New York, I had a difficulty uh, already, just uh, crossing the Hudson River. You see, the thing is, you never step in that river twice. We, did, we change, we, we vary, uh, we become different creatures. So this return is actually, is actually a fiction. Because there is no home to return. Home is where you hang your hat and say no to power. Finish. To finish the Q&A, thank you so much. And thank you again, Dr. Zabashi. Let's give him another round of applause, please.